While many Western gamers know Romancing Saga with that distinct name, the first of the series was originally called the Final Fantasy Legend, and could easily be mistaken for being part of the Final Fantasy series. In Japan, it was called Makai Toshi Saga, or Warrior in the Tower of the Spirit World Saga, and was released on the Game Boy. At the time, the Final Fantasy Legend was released alongside Final Fantasy II. Confusing, I know. While they are similar, what with a turn-based battle, overworld roaming, towns and so forth, Legend tried a few new things. Adding multi-worlds, an evolving class system, relying on loosely connected stories and side quests rather than a grand narrative, it had unique races that varied dramatically depending on what they ate, the ability to save anywhere at any time, and the series' eventual life point mechanic, in where a character can fall in battle a set number of times, and if they go beyond the number, they are gone forever. There were a great number of things that differentiated the two, and Legend won out on popularity, being the first Square game to sell over 1 million copies. This paved the way for sequels in the form of the Final Fantasy Legend 2 and 3. Legend 2 introduces a future staple in Saga games where you have a choice in who your main character is, selecting from 8 different characters and assuming their journey. One cool thing was that a game over didn't happen when all the characters fell. Instead, you were revived by Odin, who told you to try again, but that feature is eventually lost as you progress through the game. Legend 3 didn't present anything revolutionary, though its story of time travel, using a time traveling ship, made me definitely think of Chrono Trigger. But that was okay, as the series was about to have a name change, one that many gamers recognize, Romancing Saga. This was the first game where the series began to grow apart from other JRPGs and developed its own brand. It went back to the mechanic of choosing your main character, but this time each character had their own unique plot to follow and lived in different locations, rather than Legends 2 of whoever you picked had the same story of finding their father. Even with a loose main plot happening, Romancing Saga vied for open-endedness, offering up a buttload of choices for the player to make and giving them the freedom to choose whatever quest to do and complete in any order. It also registered which quests you completed and which you ignored, and would factor that in to the overall outcome of the storyline. Unfortunately, Romancing Saga lacked in integrating the other main characters' stories together, leaving them fairly undeveloped despite being a possible main character at the start. The main idea that Romancing Saga wanted to promote was that the player could create their own story by picking and choosing. Romancing Saga 2 went even further with the decision making, factoring in what you did, where you went, and who you brought in your party. By the time Romancing Saga 3 came around, it was given much more freedom to experiment. The game had a storyline that could be told differently depending on which of the eight characters you picked. It allowed characters to equip seemingly any weapon, gain skills from said weapon usage, combine magic spells and weapon skills, level scaling enemies, and of course, a loose plot that was made richer by the completion of side quests. It also heavily relied on NPC interaction for characters to discover new places on the map, which is cool in theory, but can be frustrating as hell in practice. So what did this game inspire? What did it introduce to the world of gaming? Well, a lot actually. Romancing Saga was always testing out new things, taking the risk to create new game experiences for the player, even if that meant destroying their franchise with Unlimited Saga's battle system where you rely on a slot machine wheel to perform attacks. One of the biggest inspirations would have to be Pokemon, as it took the success of Legend 1 into consideration for making the game on the Game Boy, thinking only action games would succeed on the handheld console. The game style was very similar in the Game Boy games of the Saga series. You progressed through dungeons, interacted with NPCs and towns, places were cut off and inaccessible for the time being, all the ingredients for Pokemon. Oh, and the battle system layout looks really similar. I mean, come on, look at that. Another game that benefited from Romancing Saga's bold game design advances was Rudra no Hiho, or Treasures of the Rudras. The story is divided into three major scenarios, with their own main character, different quests and tasks completed by one major story would affect the other, and the usual saga freedom of completing the scenarios in any order. Certain aspects of Romancing Saga's experimenting definitely shaped some game series we know and love today. The level scaling system introduced in Saga 3, where monsters grow stronger according to your character's levels, is used in Final Fantasy VIII, Elder Scrolls games, Dragon Age, Fallout games, it's pretty neat how far one mechanic goes. In many of the games I just listed, they also follow what Romancing Saga 1 and 2 gave players, and that was decision making in the game that could influence the overall story. So if you hate impactful decisions in games, you have Saga to blame for that. 
So is this series still inspiring today, or has it been lost to time? Well, take a look at Octopath Traveler, and try not to draw parallels to the saga series. It's got eight main characters to choose from, each with their own unique story and location, it relies on many side quests you encounter throughout your travels, some of which shape the path to the optional dungeon and boss at the end of the game. It has a map that slowly expands when you explore it, and while Romancing Saga has a slew of problems with navigating the map and direction, Octopath basically holds your hand and points you in the right direction. The greatest frustration at Saga's location finding was in Romancing Saga 3, where you had to ask NPCs about vague locations and try and find them on the map. The highlight of this was the access to the Snowland, which was the most cryptic of all. You would have to watch the overworld sky at night until Aurora Borealis happened. Aurora Borealis! Then you selected a specific spot and you were magics to a snowman land. Thank God Octopath didn't do that. Two small details that make me think of Saga when playing Octopath was, first, the fact that characters rush in from the side of the screen when battles start. Saga 3, they jumped in from the right, where Octopath, they kind of run. Still makes me happy seeing that. Second, Octopath shows you how you finished off bosses throughout your game and adds a montage during the credits. While Saga 3 shows off other unique techniques and skills during fights, it does record what your final attack was that ended the final boss. Little things like that make me extremely happy. I'm sure there are many more things that the Saga series has done, but those were the most obvious ones to me. I basically created this video because my experience through Octopath Traveler reminded me of my happy memories playing through Saga games, both in graphics and gameplay, and of course in music too, because I love video game music.